Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kohler Group's Expansion into China webinar series. We have now reached part 10 of 10 webinar sessions we have been holding in the last two weeks in order to aid foreign investors not only with their market entry into China, but also their operations, how to maintain compliance. And finally today, the main topic um, of today is how to exit China successfully obviously not the most happiest of topics uh, to talk about today. Now, as our recent webinars have shown, it is difficult and time-consuming to form a company in China and then to think about all the aspects needed to operate and maintain it. Companies have been extremely successful in the Chinese market, have been operating for a number of years. And unfortunately, there are those companies that have either not done their research, have just not been profitable in the market, or have simply incur incurred too much bad luck and too many obstacles to be successful. Now, as you might expect, the procedure for shutting down a company is also subject to formal procedures and regulations in China. You cannot simply just abandon your company. PRC law requires for all corporations, foreign or domestic, to follow a formal deregistration procedure. And that also includes representative offices. Now, most foreign investors figure that they have pretty much suffered enough from the Chinese bureaucracy and the fact that they've lost face with the fact that their company has failed. So they tend to avoid this formal process and simply abandon their company. Now, in taking this course of inaction, they assume that there will be no administrative dissolution and that will be the end of the matter. They are wrong. And the whole point of today's webinar is to explain to you what procedures there are in terms of successfully closing down or exiting the Chinese market and looking at what you should not do and what consequences might you incur if you don't follow these formal procedures. Now, before we begin today's presentation, I'd just like to make sure that the sound system is functioning. If everybody could click on the hand button within their control panel, that will allow me to know that you can hear me. Now, if there are any um, audio difficulties on my end, please don't exit the webinar. It usually takes about, uh, well, it takes a few seconds, up to a minute for the sound system to return back. It, it's really dependent on the internet stability on my side. If you are having audio difficulties, it will also be dependent on your internet instability. Just note that you can switch from mic and speakers uh, to a telephone landline um, in the audio section of your control panel. Now, as is typical with um, Kohler Group's webinar series, we do enjoy having interactive Q&As. Um, this is the first time I'm presenting on this topic, and so the presentation is quite in-depth, um, and we might not have time for Q&As at the end, but uh, by all means, please still place your questions and comments, and I will get back to you personally um, once the webinar is completed. Now, for those of you that are new to to Kohler Group's webinar series. Um, allow me to introduce who we are. Kohler Group is a CSC company. Uh, we have 10 offices within three jurisdictions in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. We have just over 120 professionals. We've been established since 1979, and our main objective is to help foreign invest investors with their market entry, um, their pre-investment advisory, uh, incorporation, and all administrative functions that need to occur with a company once it's established. So everything from tax accounting, payroll, to corporate compliance activities. Um, one of our unique uh, advantages is that we do speak over 10 languages internally and are able to communicate with our clients um, in their mother tongue. A little bit about myself, my name is Christina Kohler Coluccia. I'm a director with Kohler Group. I've been working with the company since 2003 when I first opened our Shanghai office. Um, since that time, I've expanded our operations to having eight offices in China. I've been helping foreign investors with their market entry and expansion within the Chinese territory, as well as their liquidation, which is the main reason for today's topic. 
Um, I'm co-author of our monthly magazine, and I'm, I'm also responsible for all the um, online resources that we publish. Uh, it's all complimentary, and if you're interested in subscribing, we provide all up-to-date information on all regulations that have just come out in the three jurisdictions that we operate in. Um, you can simply insert your email address into the section entitled ChinaInvest.biz information series on our homepage and you will start getting our weekly e-newsletters with all the necessary updates. Now, let's begin with today's topic. How to exit the market? Well, the world's second largest economy expanded about 6.7% 6 year on year in the first quarter of 2016 and the year ended um, with around a 6.5% uh, growth. It was slightly slower than, than 2015. Now, according to the European Union uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, they publish a yearly survey on um, the various larger members um, of, of the chamber in terms of their success or slash failures in the Chinese market. Now, the latest survey of, of 541 European companies um, concluded that China had reached an economic slowdown. Nearly one-fifth of the companies surveyed said they are considering shifting some of their China investments to other markets. One of the reasons for this development is the difficulties set by the Chinese government towards foreign companies, such as the restriction for market access to foreign banks and brokerage houses, or the blocking of internet firms like Facebook and Twitter. Regardless of how attractive and profitable China might be for foreign investors, there will always be companies that do not succeed or may have to liquidate due to external factors. Now, there are three different ways to exit the Chinese market. The liquidation of the company, the sale of the company within China, as well as the sale of the shareholding company. Now, in this webinar, we're going to explore each of the possibilities and analyze the legal and tax components, and then we're also going to look at what could happen if you just abandon your company? Now, liquidation of a company in China. So one option is to formally dissolve the company. This means long, drawn-out government audits and a process that can take up to two years to complete. On the other hand, the main advantage is the possibility to return to China or to open a new business without any negative history. So for the liquidation process in China, there are existing regulations under Chinese law, and the process involves complex government approval processes, particularly with the tax bureau. The tax bureau is the number one bureau where really the liquidation has to be approved. And there are certain distinctions between um, dissolving a limited company and dissolving a representative office. Now, the procedure for closing a limited company in China can take between 18 to 24 months. 18 months if you're lucky, 24 months if you're not so lucky. And according to PRC law, a limited company must be dissolved if, it, if it, any of the following circumstances occur. And I just want to mention that all of these circumstances are highlighted in the exit clauses of the Articles of Association of the Limited Company. So there, um, the term of the operation expires and you're planning on not renewing it. The company experiences financial difficulties and the board deems it necessary to dissolve the company. Um, due to force majeure, uh, the company ends up being bankrupt. The government has decided to close down the entity due to illegal acts incurred by the company. Or any other reasons that you have highlighted and included within your Articles of Association. Now, upon the declaration of dissolution with the approval authorities, the company is required to start the liquidation procedures. And as stated in the Articles of Association, a liquidation committee must be formed in order to handle this procedure. A last audit is required. Now, this last audit is what we call a closure audit. The closure audit is done by a PRC-regulated auditor, um, and in reality, they, depending on the city where you're lo located in, they will look at the last three years to five years of business that has incurred. The auditor is required to check all financial aspects associated with the company. Um, they have to make sure uh, that everything has been dealt with, accounts payable, accounts receivable, tax payable, write-offs for bad debts. 
And basically, once the audit is completed, deregistration of the company is first done at the Tax Bureau. Once the Tax Bureau has reviewed the audit, the financials, and this process alone can take up to 12 months, one year of back and forth communication with the Tax Bureau in relation to all of these situations. Um, it's at that point, once the Tax Bureau says, yes, uh, we agree, you are now officially closed and terminated, no more taxes are liable for the company, then you have to do further closures with the MOFCOM, um, the Ministry of Commerce, um, as well as the Administration of Industry and Commerce, and then all other bureaus, you know, the Customs Bureaus, uh, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, and last but not least, the company has to close down its bank accounts. Now, any of the capital that is still sitting in the bank accounts will then be transferred to the shareholding entity. So as you can see, it is a deeply uh, investigative approach by the Tax Bureau to review exactly what has been happening with the company. Um, and that's why they take 18 to 24 months to make sure there is no outstanding liabilities or anything that has been occurring within the company. Now, in terms of liquidating a company, um, there are three methods. So, you know, the first I, I gave, I provided three options on how to exit the market. The first one was liquidation of the company. Um, I've just gone through the option of formally dissolving the company. So, basically paying all existing debts, um, including all debts to employees, to the government, etc. It's the transparent way of closing down your business. But there are two other methods. The, the second one is filing for bankruptcy liquidation. So if your company does not have the funds or assets to pay its debts, it may liquidate under China's bankruptcy laws. Um, and we have many times looked at this option for our clients and many times we've been of the view that this option would have been a legally viable one based on the circumstance of our clients. Now, the last option is an informal petering out, which I tend to call um, making the company frozen. Now, informal petering out basically means that you are just keeping that entity with a registered office address. You are filing taxes, but you're filing zero taxes. You have no employees, no transactions. But because you are not sure, you know, right now you've gone through an obstacle um, and you've gone through a situation where you've determined business has to be halted and stopped in China. You've terminated employees, um, you've downsized everything so that you have the bare bones of a company in China. Meaning you just have the registered office address and all you're doing is the minimal compliance procedures to maintain that entity so that it doesn't get blacklisted. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, for a lot of companies, you know, as I said, they go through these immediate obstacles. It could be because a general manager did something wrong or completely broke down your business or you've had PR issues and you want to kind of peter out of the system a little bit and then come back in full blast and it might be one year to two years that you're not operating in China, but it's giving you this time to um, focus again on how you want to approach the Chinese market. And the advantage of this is although you are paying for an office address, you have to pay rent somewhere, um, and you are paying for compliance uh, procedures to occur within your entity, it is a much cheaper way to maintain the company versus liquidating it, which takes two years, and then starting a brand new company from scratch, um, which takes at least three to four months if it's a consulting company. So this informal petering it out is, is an is a intermediary way for companies to maintain their presence um, very subtly um, so that when they're ready to, to attack the market and go back into the market, um, they are ready to, uh, they have the entity ready and, and, and they can just go ahead. Now, um, I want to go through three case studies of companies um, that I've experienced where really there were quite a few problems, not problems, but, but obstacles that existed during the liquidation procedure. The first one is 
was a was was a joint venture in Shanghai. Um, it was a joint venture uh, between a Dutch company and a Chinese company. Um, it was a very very small manufacturing operation in Shanghai, uh, which was not properly managed by the Chinese party. The Dutch company decided that they wanted to close down the operation. There was a formal agreement between both parties to close down the operation, and the liquidation process began. Now, because of the poor disorganization within the company, it was discovered during the liquidation process that there was a pack of Fa Piaos, and I had mentioned this in my previous webinars, the Fa Piaos are the formal invoices issued to clients, and as I had highlighted in my previous webinars, Fa Piaos are like pieces of gold. You don't want these to disappear. Now they had an entire book of Fa Piaos disappear. They couldn't find where it was, who had it, etc. Um, I don't want to make assumptions here on, on what happened internally within that company, but the consequence for the liquidation process was they had to pay a penalty of 10,000 RMB per sheet that was missing within that booklet. Now you've got to imagine each booklet has approximately 30 to 50 sheets. So this is not a peanuts penalty to pay, particularly if one, your business hasn't been successful, you've had a falling out with your partner, um, your partner has been completely disorganized, and now you as the foreign investor has this penalty to pay, which is tremendous when, when actually all you want to do is close down the company. Now, not only did they have to pay a penalty, but in addition to that, they had to, to put a public announcement in the local newspaper to, to say this. As a consequence, the Dutch party gave up. They basically said, you know what, we're fed up with the disorganization and the mess. Um, we want to abandon. The Chinese party said, well, I don't have the money or the capital to pay for this. I'm going to abandon. And as a consequence, both investors within the Administration of Industry and Commerce have now been blacklisted. And later on in this, uh, this presentation, I will explain the consequences if you are put in the blank list of the AIC. The second case study is looking at the accounts receivables, the accounts payables, and any type of loans that have been paid to the company. Now, I had mentioned in my previous webinars that the typical foreign loans don't exist, but you do have what is called a foreign debt loan. And the foreign debt loan actually has to be paid back, or it has to be written off. Now we have incurred cases where um, uh, the tax bureaus during the liquidation process have requested that the company pay back the loan, but unfortunately there are no funds to pay back the loan, and it's put the whole liquidation process at a halt. Uh, the third case study is in reference to the bookkeeping, um, uh, the bookkeeping um, methodology used by the company. So we've had one company in Beijing that wants to go through a liquidation process. Um, this company, uh, during the liquidation process, the tax bureau found out that there was a differential between their tax liability um, a calculation versus what had actually been paid by. Uh, by the company. Now generally this is a, a good scenario to have because the tax bureau is going to earn more revenue dollars. The issue is, is that the company then uh, decided to fight it. They said no we don't own more. Now as I mentioned the auditor has to look at between three to five years of history of the company and there had to be a six-month process uh, investigation by the auditor requested by the tax bureau to look at every single transaction to see ultimately what was the tax liability of the company. Now you're, you know, already the liquidation process is 18 to 24 months. You're now adding an additional six months because there are differentials between the tax bureau and your own um, accounting, accounting information. So, you know, having a good accounting system in place um, and doing constant reviews is really vital if eventually you're looking to liquidate the company. Um, so as you can see, there are quite a few um, uh, things one really needs to consider uh, when liquidating a company in China, and, and you know, it all reflects back on how, um, 
how compliant have you been? How organized have you been uh, in terms of your Chinese operation? Now, with a representative office, um, the closure of a representative office usually takes between 8 to 12 months. So it's still not the most rapid of procedures. It still takes quite a lot of time. With a representative office, they will look at the last three years of operation in terms of the closure audit. Um, and obviously, it's, a, it's the same principles. The tax bureau will take a look first to see if there are any tax liabilities. And then you do the closures um, with the Administration of Industry and Commerce and the MOFCOM. And then the final step is the deregistration um, or closing down with the bank. Representative offices are relatively straightforward. I've never come across an obstacle when doing any of these types of liquidations, um, primarily because a rep office is really just a pure cost center. Um, and so, you know, what the tax bureaus are looking at is have all costs associated with the rep office been truthfully recorded, meaning has all rental amounts been recorded, all employee payroll salaries been included, the social insurance included, um, associated with the payrolls, um, looking at disbursements from employees, uh, you know, the typical costs that are related to um, a, a liaison office's operation. And they will then see whether all the taxes that have been, uh, have been properly declared as well. Now, the second method of uh, exiting the market successfully would be selling the shares of your China company. Now, handling a merger and acquisition in China uh, can just be as cumbersome as anywhere in the world. The key issue is obviously finding a suitable buyer, which requires having a network of potential investors, whether that is a strategic partner or a private equity firm, for example. Um, the next step is the due diligence process that the buyer will perform on your Chinese entity. Um, and the due diligence process is very similar to the closure audit that is done in the liquidation. So the due diligence process will be from a legal perspective as well as a financial one. Um, it's important here to note that the ease of fin finalizing uh, an M&A transaction would be that the company has had no bad history and most importantly it has filed all its papers in an orderly manner. So being organized and making sure you have all the documents. Um, the due diligence is then followed by the contract negotiations for the sale and purchase of the shares and then finally the equity transfer. Um, this alone would require the buyer as well as the seller to understand what the PRC law is in relation to this. Naturally, a, a, a key component of the transaction would be whether there are any tax implications that befall the buyer or the seller in terms of capital gains tax. Now, capital gains tax would only be imposed um, if the company has been profitable throughout its history. Um, <clears throat> now, things are complicated by the fact that the capital gains tax levied in China varies according to where the selling entity has its tax residence. And it's all based on the double taxation agreements between that jurisdiction and China. So although the capital gains tax for foreign investors for most countries is around 10%, some jurisdictions, especially those with whom China has completed the DTAs, can benefit from lower uh, capital gains taxes. So to give you an example, um, uh, investors in Hong Kong um, and then you know, the, sellers in, uh, the buyers in Hong Kong and the sellers in China, uh, the capital gains tax there would be 5%. So finally, when the M&A transaction is finalized, this, the, the next step would be handling the change of the shareholder and all the internal positions within the Chinese entity and also updating the Articles of Association. And all of that requires government approval. Now, um, the third section of successfully exiting the Chinese market would be selling the shares of your shareholding company. Um, and this is the main reason why we recommend clients to have holding companies, um, whether it be in Hong Kong, whether it be in Singapore, uh, whether it be in the UK, in Ireland, uh, etc. Uh, the selling of the shares of your shareholding company means that, in theory, no government approval should occur in mainland China, meaning you don't have to go through the bureaucratic proceedings. Obviously. The same procedures I highlighted before in terms of doing, um, you know, finding, uh, finding a, a strategic partner, finding a buyer, 
going through a due diligence process, negotiating the share transfer agreement, you know, all of these things still apply, but you're not doing any formal approvals locally in China, and it makes the whole process um, a lot easier. So definitely when you are in that stage of market entry in China, this is definitely one of the reasons why we recommend, if you ever want to exit the market, to sell your shareholding company versus directly selling your, your Hong Kong entity. Now, let's move on to the last part of today's section, which is, is abandonment an option? Now, simply abandoning a company is, is from my perspective, a major mistake that will have long-term corporate as well as personal re repercussions um, um, as there are severe sanctions within China. When a company is abandoned, it basically means that the annual registration procedures and tax filings have not been conducted. If it's not been conducted, it means, and, and this all relates to the corporate compliance webinar that I did. So if any of those annual corporate compliance procedures have not taken place, um, you've not applied for extensions, then what happens is, is you are put on the blacklist. And ultimately, your business license of the company will be revoked. Now, we've just come across a company that has done something similar. They established their company in China. They uh, established it, it, it taking between four to six months. And at the end of that procedure, because it takes so long, they changed their mind about the Chinese market. Their theory was, well, we're newly established. We don't need this entity. What's the point of doing a formal liquidation when actually there have been zero transactions that have run through the company and we haven't even transferred the registered capital? Now, the consequences of that is because the following year, they didn't do the annual registration procedures. They didn't do the tax filings. Two and a half years later, they decide to go into the Chinese market. And because they decided to go into the Chinese market again, they said, well, we already have an entity. Let's reawaken that entity. But unfortunately, the entity is blacklisted. At this point, two and a half years later, the company is not only blacklisted with the Administration of Industry and Commerce because the annual registration procedures haven't occurred, but also with the Tax Bureau because zero tax filings have occurred. It has taken close to six months to get the company off the blacklist. And I think it was more of an ego issue for the company to make sure they got off the blacklist versus actually setting up a brand new entity. But the issue ultimately is if they would have set up a brand new entity, the, uh, the, uh, the issue is, is that they would have had to use a new shareholding company because the shareholder of the old company was uh, blacklisted as well. Now, um, all of this is, is quite you know, serious. Now, why, why is it actually um, serious? Well, primarily because if the company decides to leave China, really it must immediately cease doing all business. You have to have public announcements saying that you're going to close down your company. All your company chops and licenses have, be, have to be returned back to the company. And ultimately, you should have no debts um, you know, basically no accounts receivables, no payables, all assets should be sold, etc., etc., and you should have no tax liabilities. So if you're not going through these annual compliance procedures, the government is automatically thinking that you're abandoning the company. They're not even going to come and check. They're just going to put you automatically on the blacklist. Now, I, I, love, I love this saying, um, bottom line is you can run, but you cannot hide, right? You have to follow the rules. And failure to properly liquidate your company, it results in a number of penalties that can be imposed on the management and the shareholders of the company. So as a basic rule, the legal representative and the other directors are personally liable for any damages caused to creditors by the company's failure to strictly comply with the liquidation requirements. This means abandoning a company is a big mistake, particularly if you have debt. Um, and, you know, an important thing is 
that the legal representative, so whoever you've appointed within your corporate structure, structure legal representative or the executive director or the board of directors, they are personally liable for the company if you are abandoning it. Um, in theory, the shareholders should also be, but in our experience, what has occurred is that the shareholders are generally um, taken off the hook, uh, and, it, and it's really the, the legal reps and the directors that are, that are um, personally liable. So the first step by the Chinese government is to put all of the potentially liable parties on a blacklist. Um, the general manager, which is fun, funny because the general manager is handling the day-to-day -day activities of the company, the general manager is not liable. It's actually only the legal representative and the directors of the company. And uh, the general manager, although not technically liable, at the first instance will be put on the blacklist. Um, the company's failure to pay its taxes, failure to pay its employees, failure to pay major creditors, this is all noted within the blacklist. So they have, you know, names of employees, um, they have tax liability amounts, they have information on who the creditors are, etc. The blacklist is issued by the State Administration of Industry and Commerce. Um, and when it is issued by the State Administration of Industry and Commerce, this information is passed on to the Border Control Authority, i.e. immigration. So as a consequence, immigration will know uh, all the names of the legal reps, the directors, the general managers, and they will be halted um, whenever entering China. So the personal liabilities, basically if the legal representative, um, this person is not permitted to act as a director, manager, supervisor of a Chinese company for a period of three years. Shareholders, also not permitted to do anything for a period of three years. And the name of the company cannot be used also for a period of three years. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, it's all a matter of not complying and not going through the formal liquidation processes. Now, again, as I mentioned in my introduction, the key point is understanding that a lot of people, because they've gone through various obstacles or, you know, some might even say we've gone through a nightmare um, in China, um, the, the thought of having to go, a liquid, to, to go through a liquidation procedure that might take 18 to 24 months, really, you know, they're just so fed up with China, it's the last thing that they want to consider, especially when additional cost is involved. You have to pay for the auditors to do a closure audit, looking at the last three years of your history. Um, there's still a lot of communication that occurs. You have to fire all the employees properly. Uh, pay all the necessary compensations to them. Uh, you need to make sure that you've paid your creditors. Um, you, you, you have so much responsibility in making sure everything is transparently and cleanly cut off and terminated um, that for a lot it's usually you know the last thing that they want to do. Now if you don't do it, the experiences have been that when you go, let's say you've terminated your employment with this company, but because you haven't done a formal liquidation and you were the acting legal rep, for example, the minute that you want to do a new business trip to China or you want to do a vacation to China, you will be halted at immigration. You might even put, be put under hotel arrest until all debts are settled. That's really worst case scenario and trust me, it has occurred in China. So be aware of all of these scenarios. Now, it's important to note that at the end of last year, beginning of this year, the government has uh, created a more efficient and systematic deregistration process. The timings are still at around 18 to 24 months. That's at least what we've been told uh, by the tax officers and the Administration of Industry and Commerces because this um, new, de new efficient and systematic deregistration process has been implemented. Um, it's, it's, it's basically a matter to see whether, whether time frames will be reduced. But the issue is, for me more, is as a company, don't have fear to go through the liquidation process. Go through it transparently. You want to be able to leave the market 
knowing that there's, you know, that you could sleep well at night, knowing that you've closed down a company, you've paid all your debts, and you have treated the people that you've employed fairly enough that you've terminated them well as well. That's, that's really the key of why you want to exit the market. And why do I say that? Because you don't know what the future may hold. As a board member or as a legal rep, you don't know if you're still going to be working for this company or you may have a new position and you may want to go into the Chinese market. As a corporate strategy, as a company strategy, now might not be the right time to be operational in China, but in two years or three years, you may want to re-enter and re-attack the market. So do things right. Do things transparently. Don't just abandon things that have not been successful. Now, that is to the end of today's presentation. Um, it's gone very quickly, uh, which is nice for a Friday, I hope. Um, there have been no questions that have come in, so I assume that uh, I've been uh, quite clear in all the instructions in relation to exiting the market and, and, and how to do that successfully and transparently. Um, if you do have personal stories you want to share or comments about exiting the market, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'd be happy to reach out to you and, and discuss your case separately. Nobody tends to want to really bring up the subject of, of liquidating and, and not being successful in the Chinese market. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank everyone for participating in our 2017 Expansion into China webinar series. It's been an extremely successful last 10 days, and we look forward to seeing you again next year uh, when we redo this webinar series, hopefully with new and hot topics that have occurred um, throughout the remainder of this year. Last but not least, if you are interested in subscribing to our e-newsletter or to our magazines, um, it can be easily done so on our website. Don't hesitate to just do it. Go ahead, insert your email address. Um, all of our webinar recordings are put on our YouTube page, so if you would like or you missed um, our past webinars, um, don't hesitate to listen to them in your own time. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn. If you're not interested in getting our e-newsletters on LinkedIn, we also post all of our resources um, and journals and, and things like that as well. I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed uh, the last 10 days of our webinar series, and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>